What do you remember most about the conflict in the Falklands? The fact that, you know, um, you were going to war. So up until that point in your career, uh, your job had been flying the flag for the United Kingdom, uh, visiting foreign countries, having a good run ashore here, there and everywhere. But the concept of going to war never crossed your mind. Suddenly, uh, here it was, for real, yeah? Yeah. And that's the most memorable thing to take away from the conflict is the fact that you were going to be engaging with an enemy, yeah. A memorable moment would be the 25th of May, because uh, I've got some photographs here. You can see the amount of damage that we sustained. On the 25th of May, uh, the intelligence we got from uh, the government was that it was Argentine's National Day and they were going to mount a heavy assault against us, being Broadsword and Coventry, who were sat in two pretty vulnerable, vulnerable positions. And we were actually hit by a thousand pound bomb. The thousand pound bomb, luckily for us, didn't explode because the planes were flying so low that they had uh, what's called a centrifugal arming system in them, which means the bomb has to spin so many times before it arms, which will make it explode. So basically, they, they launched a thousand pound lump of metal at us, which went through the side of the ship, ripped a hole through the flight deck. And as you can see from the photograph, took the nose of the Lynx helicopter off which had a sea skewer missile attached to it at the same time. And I can assure you, if that bomb had gone off, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. <laughs> First time we were attacked, it took everyone by surprise because nobody was expecting it. But the captain had given authority for the Royal Marines that we had on board to uh, use their small arms against the attacking aircraft. And this is Colour Sergeant Bill Leslie, who was in charge of the Royal Marine Battalion that we had on board. And where his fingers are there, where his head was literally moments before that shell struck the side of the ship. One of his Marines, who was stood next to him, shooting at the same plane, saw what was coming, shoved him out of the way. And that's the result after, in the aftermath, that you could actually have a picture taken where his head was literally seconds before. So yeah, some memorable moments. Yeah. Very lucky man. <laughs> Very lucky, yeah. Being scared, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. Um, but also having said that, um, knowing that you had the lads around you, you could rely on. Um, yeah, it's the ups and downs. Uh, one minute you're at action stations, the next minute you stood down. Um, constant, you basically, it was like he was on a knife edge all the time. Um, having said that, there were times, there was humorous times in amongst it, but uh, not so much, but again, I can look back at it now and there was certain humour there, but um, the fear of not seeing your family again, that type of thing. So did you have any idea what was going on on any other ships while you were? We did get uh, daily up updates. Um, I mean, huge moments being when the Conqueror sunk the Belgrano at the start, uh, and then obviously the retaliation by the Argentinians firing an Exocet missile at Sheffield, which was a direct hit and uh, sunk it. From that moment on, for the conflict, it changed. Everything changed for us. Uh, we realised then that we were involved in a, a proper conflict here. And the whole sort of ethos of, of what we were doing really started to come home. And it was little things like uh, on your AGR, on your gas mask, you've got two identity tags. Everybody in, in the Navy will be aware of that. We were told that we had to start wearing them. We got called down to the ship's office and we were given a thing called a conduct under capture card, which is just like in the movies, where it says if you are captured, you have to give your name, your serial number and your rank and the vessel upon which you serve, no more information. So it was part of the Geneva Convention. So all these things really brought it home to you that this is a real conflict, yeah. From our point of view, we heard all the news about ships being hit, some sunk. We saw some ships, um, the night the Atlantic conveyor was, was hit, she passed us. We were on the edge of the exclusion zone. So we saw her go in the next day. We heard that she got hit. Um, and that's, that's quite hard to take, because I've seen her in all her glory sail right past us, and waved and you know, hoot, two in horns. The next day, she's at the bottom of the ocean. That, that's kind of hard to understand. Uh, as a hospital ship, we were doing a particular task so that's in, pick up casualties, back out, drop them off onto the big hospital ship, back, backwards and forwards all the time. We didn't really get time to think about, it's only when we got the news, oh, HMS 
Sheffield's got hit, HMS Coventry's got hit. It's only when the number starts to rack up, two ships, three ships, four ships, you think, oh dear, this is not going as planned. Um, and then of course it all turns out well in the end. But no, we didn't have really any idea what was going on. How did you communicate with family when you were away? <laughs> we didn't really, in that, in that sense. Um, Your communication was just a royal mail bluey, as we call them, which is two sides, folds out into three. Um, and you just send them off and your parents send them back to you. So they tell me what's going on with the football and the family. And, but their concerns were obviously what they were hearing on the news. And I was telling them what we were doing. And of course, it gets lost in translation a little bit. My mother and father were, my father wasn't worried because he was ex-army and he just said, well, he's just doing his job and that's it. Mum was obviously different and she's a little bit more emotional. So she was obviously scared. And when she saw pictures of ships being bombed and the toll of people dying ramps up, she's obviously thinking, oh, it's my boy going to be one of them. Uh, I tried obviously to reassure her that hopefully it wasn't going to be, but um, so yeah, communication was just, just by letter. No, no phone calls or anything like that. You could only write a certain amount down there, but it wasn't as if you could write a book to the family telling them what was going on or anything. You just put the essentials down. Um, we could send them off as often as we wanted. It was getting the return mail that was not as, uh, it's not as easy in the sense that we got mail drops every so often. What was the feeling on HMS Brilliant when you got the news that war is over? We got the signal saying that the white flag was flying over Stanley. And of course we were over the moon. Well, I was, <laughs> and I'm assuming the rest of the guys were as well. Um, but again, that was Stanley. That was the land side of it. Nobody said anything about the Argentine Air Force, whether they were going to keep up attacking us or whatever. So we still had our, you know, wits about us uh, because we didn't know if we were going to come under air attack again or, or whatever. But the general feeling was just sheer happiness that A, it was over and B, we'd survived.